It's the start of the pandemic all over again. We're all in lockdown, and you're only able to leave your home to get essential supplies. You need to jump in your car to go to the supermarket. You hop in, and you realize you're low on petrol, and you can't touch anything. Have you ever thought about how many hands have been on those petrol pumps? <laughs> Cast your mind back to the great toilet paper shortage of 2020 and those unnervingly empty shelves on the supermarkets. Those supply chains are extremely vulnerable to disruption. Have you ever thought about how utterly reliant we are on transport for our food and medical supplies, for getting to and from work, just doing our work, for our medical and emergency services, saving lives and putting out fires? That volatile fuel that we put in those vehicles comes from some of the most volatile parts of the world. That means that if there was any sort of military conflict, natural disasters, or economic shock that cut the flow of fuel to Australia, the entire nation would come grinding to a halt. What a catastrophe in the making. I feel locked into this system. I don't want to feel prey to price gouging and ever-rising fuel prices. I don't want to feel like I'm contributing to climate change every time that I jump in the car. And I don't want myself or any other parents out there to feel the guilt that I felt every single time that I had to drive my tiny little humans around for hours on end to try and put them to sleep. I love them. They might steal my sleep, but they give me a reason to dream of a better future. Globally, Transport accounts for one-fifth of humanity's total emissions. Every little puff from the exhaust pipes of our cars adds to the 7.3 billion tonnes of CO2 created annually. We need to act now to curb emissions. Fortunately, there are changes happening in the global landscape. Some of the world's largest automobile manufacturers, like GM, Ford, Volvo, Mercedes, listen have committed to entirely 100% electric vehicle production lines within a decade. 30 countries have pledged to ban the sale of new combustion engines by 2040, with leading nations and leading economies like California and the UK by 2035. Even our neighbours across the ditch are getting on board. And this is in response to the very real existential crisis of climate change. Imagine that instead of having to drive around town to put fuel into your car, you could just plug in at the supermarket and top up whilst you shop. Or better yet, plug in at home and recharge whilst you sleep. Plugging in at home is far more affordable than putting petrol or diesel into a car. What's better is that local energy means that we don't send our hard-earned money overseas. That money stays locally, and it can be used to create jobs in an advanced economy, which is founded on economic, environmental, and social justice. Whilst this talk might seem like I'm going to be talking about electric vehicles, it isn't actually about electric vehicles, or EVs as you hear me call them. Eventually, we'll just call them cars, or trucks, or motorbikes, much in the same way that we call those awesome, super powerful computers that we carry around phones. But as I said, this talk isn't about EVs. EVs are just the Trojan horse, and a key to kick-starting a soft revolution in both transport and energy. EVs are a vehicle, quite literally, to take power back to the people, and they're a means to be able to claw back our power from the fossil fuel corporations that have a stranglehold in our democracy. First, we need to rethink what EVs are. Second, we need to think, why are we so far behind the rest of the developed world in EV uptake? And third, how can we take that power back and create a clean transport and energy future? Most people think about them solely as transport, which is understandable, given that they have motors and wheels and they get us around. Most 
petrol vehicles sit idle the majority of the time whilst we're at work or at home. But EVs are so much more. They're batteries. And batteries have uses far outside of transport. To appreciate what this means, I'll give you a quick Electricity 101. Traditionally, energy is generated centrally by large power plants and then distributed through the national grid. This is changing. In Tasmania, we get most of our power from hydroelectric and wind sources. Australia is having a rapid growth in renewables. We have the highest penetration of rooftop solar per capita of anywhere in the world. This means that people are transitioning from being consumers of energy, but also producers of energy. And it's a term that we energy nerds like to call prosumers. In our electricity grid, wires distribute energy. Wires connect the physical dimension of space. With ever-increasing renewables from our rooftops, from large-scale solar and wind, we're starting to see the possibility of weaning ourselves from coal and gas. Renewable energy is intermittent. We get our power when the wind blows or when the sun shines. In order to reach an electricity system with 100% renewables, we need storage. Storage bridges the time dimension between now and then. And here's the magic. EVs are a type of storage that connect time. They're also, they can be part of our electricity distribution system by transporting energy from place to place. This means that our humble EVs connect space-time. <laughs> Multi-dimensional space-time travel! <laughs> I think Einstein would be proud. <laughs> What's more, we can power our cars from the sun, wind, and water. And that is an awesome paradigm shift. Done well, integrating EVs into our electricity grid can prevent blackouts, shore up our, our electricity grid, and make wind and solar power more reliable sources of energy for everybody. But how can a car do that? Well, a car parked and charging can optimize its charging schedule so that most or all of its energy comes from renewable sources. It can also ramp down its charging when there's peak demand in the network. But wait, there's more. Bidirectional charging. This means not only drawing in power to charge your car, but also being able to send that power out. You can power your tools at a construction site and you can run your home. Seriously, you can run your home for multiple days using the energy stored in your car. <laughs> Here in Tasmania, when the bushfires were raging, many people couldn't get to the petrol stations to get the fuel that they needed to run their, power fighting, their, their, their firefighting equipment. EVs and energy generated at home can play a really important part in protecting our homes in the future. Bidirectional charging is being trialled all around the world and even here in Australia. But we still have some barriers to overcome, technical, policy, regulatory barriers. And we also have some myth-busting to do about EVs. Batteries do degrade, and the technology is continuously improving alongside our vehicles in terms of efficiency and the environmental standards. Not everyone can power their car from renewables all the time, but even when we power the vehicles from coal-fired power stations, they're still better. EVs are by no means a magic bullet for our environmental crisis. And we can't buy or shop our way outside, out of this situation that we're in. But our consumer choices can play a meaningful role in being able to create a pathway out of climate chaos. And I can't think of any climate technology that has more potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions than EVs. I mean, rooftop solar is awesome, but it's just not sexy. EVs have the special source. They're objects which can become part of our identity, much like the clothes that we wear, the type of car, the colour, all become expressions of our personality. And it's because of this emotional connection that EVs have the potential for really rapid uptake, kind of like the transition from dumb phones to smartphones, or from horse and cart to car. But we won't realise these benefits without applying more pressure to our government. 
In the UK, the sale of new EVs is up to 20%. In Norway, it's a whopping 75%. Whilst here in Australia, it's less than 2%. Federally, we don't have the policies to support uptake. We had a government that actively campaigned against EVs as part of its election platform. But because we don't have a price on emissions, manufacturers who sell vehicles in markets where there is a price on emissions don't even consider Australia as a viable place to sell the vehicles. And that's because they're heavily penalised for each gram of CO2 produced from those internal combustion engines that they sell. They offset these penalties with EVs which have credits. So they're not going to forego these benefits to divert supply to Australia. And we don't have any subsidies or other benefits to further incentivise manufacturers. As the rest of the world charges on, we run the very real risk of becoming the world's dumping ground for inefficient and highly polluting vehicles. But when EVs do become affordable for the masses and, most importantly, available, they'll be the obvious choice. They're faster, cleaner, smarter, smoother, way cheaper to run and maintain. And if you need the visceral thrill of a roaring V8, the world's greatest audio engineers are creating exhilarating new sounds the all-electric Porsche Taycan sounds like a spaceship jumping into hyperdrive as it goes from 0 to 100 in 2.6 seconds. That is crazy fast. But one of the things that I love about electric vehicles is the sound that they make when they're slowing down. The next time you hear a hybrid or an all-electric vehicle, just listen to that noise. That's the sound of the engine being used to slow the vehicle down instead of brake pads. That's the sound of energy being recaptured and fed back into the batteries. I love good design. I spend a lot of time thinking about how to design the people-powered systems to transition to clean transport and energy. As part of my PhD at the University of Tasmania, I look at the role of individuals and communities in transforming the electricity system through the lens of home batteries and big batteries on wheels. I sit on the state government electric vehicle working group, and for the last decade, I've been working in community-owned renewable energy, and that is renewable projects which are funded by local communities. They want to get on board with the EV revolution and make EVs more affordable and accessible. They see that it's a win for the communities and it's a win for the environment, and it works. So back in 2019, over a pot of beer sitting at the Winston pub in North Hobart, reeling from the results of the latest election and what it means for climate action or, or inaction. Sitting with my, with my friends, we decided to start a social enterprise called The Good Car Company. We wanted to make meaningful change and, and accelerate the uptake of EVs. So together with the South Hobart Sustainable Community, we created the world's first electric vehicle bulk buy. We saw that bulk buyers were what kick-started the solar industry here in Australia, and we thought, why can't those same principles be applied to EVs? The concentrated uptake has a threefold impact. One, it makes the aggregated cost savings and tangible benefits. Two, it's a strong policy lever that says to decision makers that people want EVs and they want them now. That's people, voters, voting with their actions. But three, it makes EVs commonplace. Every EV paves the way for the next person to get in. But more importantly, it normalises EVs. You see your neighbour with an EV and you have a chat. The peer effect is the most important aspect of new technology adoption. People talking to other people about their lived experience addresses the biggest deficit that we have in our toolkit for addressing climate change. Trust. Without trust, even the most phenomenal climate change technology would get nowhere. Now, Tasmania is the perfect place to create a zero carbon economy, where not only do we have 100% renewable energy, but we have a clean transport system. We have a long history of self-resiliency and sustainability. Innovation is part of our island lifeblood, and we do things a bit differently, often in a way that it reflects our island way of life. Transport powered by 100% renewable 
would not only address the security issue of imported liquid fuels, but to keep the billions of dollars spent on fuel here locally, and it would also help us meet our climate obligations. As we know, change comes from a small group of people changing a large group of people's minds. Could you imagine a tourism industry that was built around genuine sustainability, along with our wilderness arts and culture? That kind of impression that people would experience when they come here would leave long-lasting impacts. When we think about successful policy change here in Tasmania, the most successful actions have come from acting locally. The protests and the blockades protecting the Franklin River and our ancient forests, which have now become cherished for locals and tourists alike. What we're doing now is a soft revolution. So how do we get there? Just as community action created a clean, green reputation for Tasmania, we need to act now to create a new reality. And EVs are a handy tool. But this time, we don't need blockades and protests, arrests, or, or even to get our boots wet or muddy. It's as simple as changing our habits and demonstrating that we want a new way of being. And this, in turn, creates pressure for good policy, which rewards good consumer choices to make dirty transport and dirty energy a thing of the past. Now, as we know, stories are powerful. And an idea that's worth spreading can change the world. We have an opportunity to create ripple changes here to be able to demonstrate our sustainability for the rest of the world. If, if none of these reasons are enough to encourage you to take action, I'll leave you with just one more thought. The diesel particulates, they settle roughly about this height. That's the perfect height for kids in prams or in tow. We need to act now to create a better future for our kids and for everybody. Thank you.